Well, good morning. It's good to hear your joyful fellowship. I'll put those voices into a joyful song. Our first song is Be Thou Exalted, found in 57, and this is actually one of my favorite songs, and I can remember the first time I heard it was actually a teenager going to, a, uh, at that time, a camp in the summer for a Bible Memory Association. I remember it being sung there, and it's always stayed with me as something special. You'll see that this song incorporates praise to all three persons of the Trinity. Be thou exalted. Just our voices at the refrain. Be thou exalted, O Spirit of power, dwelling within our hearts to keep us from sin. God of the ages and Lord of salvation, ruler of heaven and earth, thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Communion Bible Church of Holly Springs. We're glad to have you all here. Hope you've all had a good week. And I also want to welcome you all those that are watching on YouTube this morning. Um, good to see you all. We want to welcome those of you that are visiting. It looks like we have some visitors, so it's good to meet you and good to see you. Um, I was asked to give the results from last week's votes for uh, the offices of the church. So here are the results from last week. Uh, we had three candidates that were all elected or re-elected unanimously. That's always a good thing. Steve Case is uh, re-elected to elder. Uh, Chuck Hurlbert was, again, re-elected to elder. And Pete Thompson was re-elected to deacon. As far as the calendar of events this morning, first of all, we want to welcome Raul and Josephine Perez and Richard and Karen Helms into the membership of Community Bible Church. Glad to have them part of the assembly. Tonight, Chuck will be presenting the mission work from his recent trip to Ghana and Benin. And also, uh, Community Bible Church kids will meet at 530 as well. And we'd love to have you all come worship with us tonight. The Ladies Precept Bible Study continues this Friday at 930 a.m. with a study on 1 Thessalonians. And contact Karen. Any questions about that or in her email is also listed in the bulletin. Let's open in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you now and thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that we live in a country where we can worship freely um, without any fear of persecution. I pray as your word goes forth today throughout the world that 
uh, Christians would be admonished through your word. Unbelievers would come to a saving knowledge of you and give the various pastors and those that minister your word uh, freedom of um, speech with um, your word. Um, bless this time together, and uh, I pray for Pastor Dan as he brings your word to us, that we not only listen with open ears, but open hearts as well, and be ready to apply anything that you'd have for us. Bless this time together, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. you songbirds. I do like that chorus where it says, just a child, my life is before me, but I can trust him. We all can, and so we can greatly rejoice that the Lord is still working in our lives if we are a child of God. Number 679 next, 679, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know a sin Oh, for grace to trust him more. 
Today's scripture reading will be taken from Revelation chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne, stood in, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Saying, I'm sorry, they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. I would ask the young men to come up for the offering, please. Let's open in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can return our gifts back to you. I pray that you would uh, just bless this time and the worship to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Karen, for that powerful rendition of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Um, tied in nicely with that passage that we had this morning in our scripture reading from Revelation 4. Great hymn of praise. Next, 683, Jesus, draw me ever nearer. Sing it as a prayer and with feeling. Let me ask you please to stand and sing with me. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you here today, and uh, I do want to uh, congratulate and welcome the uh, Perez family into our uh, assembly, and uh, as well, Richard and Karen, the Helms, and uh, welcome. And then many visitors today. Great to have you here, and if I've not had the privilege of meeting you yet, I look forward to, after the service, uh, meeting you and then uh, personally welcoming you and thanking you for visiting, visiting with us today. It's always good to hear the songbirds sing as well, and I hope you've enjoyed that this morning. Take your Bibles and find Hebrews chapter 10. As we come to a warning passage, we've had a number of these throughout our study in Hebrews. It's been a while, though, so we've taken our uh, studies through the book of Hebrews. We come to a warning passage here, and so in just a moment, we're going to read a lengthy portion of Scripture because it really is all in the context of where the author is taking us at this point. And so as I've mentioned before, uh, the uh, theological, the doctrinal, the uh, argumentation for who Jesus Christ is and what he has done has been well established. We have taken a number of months now throughout this summer to establish this doctrine and yet at this point, we are about to transition where he's no longer going to be making his case for Christ. He is going to be giving us the importance of acting on what we now know. And so we understand this. Much of the scripture has doctrine and duty, belief and behavior, what we know and then how we should act. And so this new section will be um, in similar fashion. In fact, this new section 
runs throughout the end of this book. Uh, while there are allusions to the Old Testament and the groundwork that he has laid, uh, we won't find the extensive work of laying and establishing who Jesus Christ is. It is all very practical, very helpful as we get through chapter 10 into all of chapter 11 and then chapter 12 and 13. So let's read together this portion of Scripture, then we'll ask for God's help and begin this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning verse 19, and we will read through verse 39. And so you have, if you have your Scriptures there, you may follow along. And if not, it will be on the screen here. And so I apologize. Give me just a second here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him." But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now let's pray and ask for God's help this morning. Father, we need your help, and we confess that the passage before us is, uh, is a challenging passage for us to hear and to think through. But we know that there are certain things that you continually remind us in this passage and throughout your word that we need to be reminded of today. And so I pray for your help with the audience that is here and the viewers online that you would search our hearts and know our ways and that you would work accordingly, giving us what we need so desperately in this hour making us who you desire us to be, teaching us what you would have us to know from this passage. And so, Father, I pray that our time remaining here this morning would be a blessed time and an honorable time, and that it would be profitable as we hear from you. If we ask these things in Christ's name, amen. 
three words or three phrases are written in the front of my Bible and in many of my books, and it's actually a phrase that is in my mind. I, whether it were written down, I would not forget this phrase learned a number of years ago as we approach Scripture. It's helpful if you want a simple way you could write these words, these phrases down. As you come to Scripture, there are three questions that you can ask to help you walk through the passage. The first question is simply the word, what? And that is the question, what does it say? When we come to scriptures, we do not bring what we want it to say. We want to simply find out what does it say. So we ask the question, what? What does it say? And we define words and we look for phrases, uh, uh, figures of speech and phrases and names and dates and everything just so we can get an idea of what is being said. And the second question that we ask is, so what? Now that we know the what what is being said, we ask the question, so what? Because that's where the real education comes. It is easy to fill our heads with a lot of dates and facts and names and figures and and things, but when we get down to studying the scriptures, when we ask, so what? That's when we really begin to understand, why is this being said? Why is it said this way? What is the purpose of this being here. And so that certainly helps us. And once we've worked through that, we have to back up a little bit, look at the context, look at the flow of the letter, who it's written to, what has been the purpose of the writing. And so then we can understand why it is being said. We must not leave it there. There's still one more question that we have to ask. After what? After so what? Now we ask the question, now what? What am I to do with this? Because no scripture is ever just intended to fill our head or to make us uh, puffed up with knowledge. It is for a purpose. And so I feel like as we've uh, mentioned before, the author of Hebrews gives to us this very pastoral letter. He has dealt for a number of chapters, 10 chapters on giving us the what and the so what. He has established that Jesus Christ is supreme. He is superior. He's the son of God. He is the only sacrifice for sins, and he is our great high priest. And we've talked about that and established that. And so the question is now, now what? What should we do about it? And as I mentioned last week, no longer will he lay this groundwork. He will begin to answer the question, now what? What is expected from us? What is anticipated by those who reject? And that's where this warning passage comes into play here. And so in these next couple verses here, he gives to us another brief summary of where we have been. Notice verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. In other words, all of the Old Testament sacrifices in review could not take away sin. They could not gain forgiveness before God They could not enhance or help enable a proper and right standing before God. All of that was given as symbols, as types, as pictures that would illustrate the one who would come, Jesus Christ. And so here the author gives to us a lot of those uh, Old Testament types and symbols. Here is mentioned the holy place. We have confidence to enter into the holy place. Now we know that this is not a place on earth. I hear some people talk about this is the church house. This is the holy place. We don't run. We don't do this. We don't do that within these walls. I think it's healthy and proper to have a respect for the house of worship or the place of God or the things. But we need to understand this is not the house of God. The body of the, the, body of the believer is actually referred to in the New Testament as the temple of of God. So, which is ironic because people who would never do things in the house of God do all kinds of things in their own bodies, and they've missed the point. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, which has been given to you? You don't belong to yourself. So, we need to remember that it's not God's house, a building, or a location, or a place on earth that we need to think about reverencing, it is our body. An amazing enablement of having His divine Spirit indwelling us. That's that's good right there. We could 
We could stop and think about that for some time. However, that's the, the point he's making here is the holy place is not a place on earth. It is into the place where God dwells. This is the heavenly place. This is the uh, holy of holies, the heavenly place. Jesus entered into that holy place, not on earth, but into the very presence of God to offer himself as our sacrifice. And so we see that, uh, uh, that we have uh, access to uh, God through Christ and his blood. Verse 20, we're told this is by a new and living way. If we recall the studies of the last few months, this is the new covenant that has been established, not the old. The living way is the Christ, his body, offered as a sacrifice. Revelation talks to us about, tells us that Jesus Christ, I'm alive, I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore because he offered himself as a sacrifice, but he is not dead. Like all other sacrifices of the Old Testament, they remained a sacrifice. Christ, because death could not hold him, resurrected and is alive today. So this is a new way. This is a living way that has been opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Now, again, he points to us to the curtain, which every Jew would have understood. The curtain that meant limitations, you can't enter here. I was at an event yesterday, and one thing was very obvious. Where I wanted to be, I couldn't go. I was at a, a motorcycle race, and they had um, semi-trucks, transporters, that literally were full of, of millions of dollars worth of motorcycles, engines, parts, enough to build three or four the raceways, I would have loved, I've toured one before, but I would have loved to have gone in there yesterday. But you know what? They had gates, they had barriers, they had fences. I couldn't get in there. Now, there were people running around who could. They were the people with access, but I could not. And it was a reminder that uh, I, uh, no matter how important I think I am or how important you think I am, right? I'm not that important when it comes to the world of motocross and supercross racing because of the gates, the barriers. We know that Israel, the people, how far could they get? Not very far. They could get into the courtyard. Could they enter the Holy of Holies? No. Could they enter the most holy place? No, there were curtains. There were barriers separating them. And it was very limited. Even then, the priests were only allowed... Once a year, the high priest, once a year, one time a year to go in. Well, you recall when Christ uttered the words, it is finished, and he gave up his life on the cross as a sacrifice, that the literal temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, which is a symbol that we now have access into the presence of God. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God for six chapters now, the author has been dealing with Jesus Christ, our great high priest. He is the one over the house of God. Again, not a physical building, but the true house of God are his people and our bodies. And so we have all of these things given in summary, and so now he's going to give us our call to action, which is verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The first thing we are called to is to come. Let us come. There's a personal invitation to us. The language here about hearts sprinkled clean and the bodies washed, it all again looks back to the Old Testament, which was symbolic, which was a picture of that which would be a reality in Christ as the high priest would sprinkle the blood on an individual and on the altar and on the mercy seat. It uh, would represent the cleansing and the forgiveness of sins. And here in Christ, we have our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed with pure water. 
access is available. And I want you to think about this because everything has changed. A good way to think about the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in Christ, everything changed. Whenever you're comparing the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament, remember this phrase, in Christ or through Christ, everything changed. In a couple weeks or whatever, we'll get to Hebrews 12. I want you to notice here what would have been the mindset of the Jewish person and truly what it was back in the days of Moses and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom, and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. You getting the picture of this? Darkness, gloom, fire, thunderings, and a voice from heaven, the voice of God, that would make you tremble. Any takers? It kept the children of Israel away. It must have struck fear in them. Notice here as we continue, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Notice, in Christ, everything changed. Notice how the approach is now. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Access has been given to us through the blood of Christ so that we don't live with the fear of approaching God and being struck dead. We are welcomed. We are invited to come to the holy city, the new Jerusalem, Mount Zion, where God is where the angels are, where there is a festive celebration. I got to thinking about this. When we think about our access to God, there's a personal invitation to come. And why don't many people take it? And I say one of the reasons is because we still have a sense of fear. We still have a sense of guilt. We still have a sense of worry. We still have a sense of concern. The passage that came to my mind was Luke 15. You remember the story, the son who uh, wrote off his family ties, um, the disrespect of asking for the inheritance, of collecting it and going off and wasting it with wild living. Well, the money ran out, the inheritance wasted, and he was worse off. And so what did he do? He wanted to come back. And be a servant, not a son. Be a servant and serve and beg for forgiveness and cast himself at the feet of his father. You remember what happened? Notice here. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, treat me as one of your hired servants. You see the fear? You see the worry? You see the concern? It's all erased. And he rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. What a story. What a picture of how God the Father has invited you through the blood of Christ to draw near, to come. If there's any concern about what you did or what you have done or how you've messed up or blown it or wasted years of your life, I'm here to tell you that through Christ, everything changes. It is the only way any sinner can approach God without being struck through the blood of Christ. And that way has been opened for us. So, draw near. Come. That's the message. It's the message of the scriptures. Look at how the scriptures end. Revelation chapter 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. This is Jesus' message to Zacchaeus, to the Samaritan woman. He offers them to come. And so, let us come. It's a personal invitation. Number two, let us stand. There's a personal commitment. Notice verse 23 in our passage. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. This is, this is the bookend. This is the back end of the bookend, the second bookend or so to speak in this long passage about Jesus Christ being our great high priest. It started back in chapter 3, verse number 1. We'll look at that verse here in just a second, actually. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling... Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Notice verse 4, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 14. Then we have, or since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The commitment here is to Stand. I've got to remind us, those who belong to God are being made more aware of the increasing uh, sinful and anti-Jesus uh, uh, world that we live in. It just seems like we're constantly reminded that our society, that our nation is not going in the direction of scriptures when it comes to who God is and who Jesus Christ is. It's going a different way. We have, um, we have a land where Christ is not loved, nor Christianity is honored, where the word of God is ignored and his truth is denied. When it comes to our duty, we're called to stand. This was the message of the Hebrews. Don't go back. Don't turn back. Don't turn your back on Jesus. Don't embrace the old covenant system. Do not turn back. Hold fast and stand. This is the personal commitment. There's an aspect of doctrine here that we need to talk about, doctrine and theology, because it is important. How we think does affect our behavior. And so we can't just say, well, whatever I feel like, or I'll be fine. You know, it's good that we understand Scripture. The hope here, it is called, 
in uh, verse number 23, the hope of our confession. There's a number of passages. Romans chapter 8 is one that probably gives to us the best concept of the sufferings in this life that are not worthy to be compared to the glory which will be revealed. But here we are. We're living in it. We're living in the times now where it's difficult. There are times of suffering. There are difficult times that we live. And so what is our hope? Well, our hope is Christ. And our hope is the future. The promise of the redemption of our bodies. We know that the earth itself is waiting for its adoption, for its revelation, for the revealing of Christ to make all things new. We look forward to that day. And so by our knowledge, it is how we not only know what we should believe, but it gives us the strength to stand firm. I do hope you understand that the more Scripture we know about who God is and how He is for us and what awaits us in the next age, the age to come, the better off we can discern our actions here when faced. You know, I, I do think that we are very close to being confronted like in a way that we never have before with an association with Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount recognizes for us that it's because of the person of Christ that we can suffer in this world, and it's because of our actions, the righteous acts that we do because of Christ. And because of those two things, we are walking uh, contrary to the path of this world. It's like we are uh, caught uh, going the wrong way when everybody else is going the opposite way. It's difficult. Pushing, bumping. It's hard to make traction. But in this world, this is where we are. One more thing we're called to do, and that is let us support. And this is the aspect of personal responsibility. Notice the next verse. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, this is a well-known verse in Hebrews. I'm quite confident you've heard it before. Three to thrive. Be in church every time the doors are open. If not, you're not doing what you've been asked to do. Have you heard that? This is one of those passages that's worth examining. And once you do, you realize it's not really talking about that at all. It's talking about the importance of mutual encouragement and accountability and support when you're gathered together. This passage here, we are members of the same family. We are uh, called to encourage one another and to stir one another up. Let me say it this way. It's not just enough to be in church every time the doors open or hit your three to thrive, which is three services in one week as a one individual has coined that over the years. The person who is at church, every time the doors open, but sits in his seat and exits faithfully, has he fulfilled the command in this passage? To stir, to encourage, to rebuke, to hold accountable, to help, to walk alongside, and to lift up. And forgive me, but I think the emphasis has been flipped on its head. So that we emphasize faithfulness to a church system or a schedule rather than what we do when we gather. And this is so important because we are in a passage that is a warning passage about walking the opposite way. 
to a group of people, some true believers, I believe, some pretenders, but nonetheless, a group of individuals who are seriously considering turning their back and going the other way. And the responsibility is laid on us all individually to encourage them, to stir them up, to love and to good works, to walk alongside them, and to help them out. Now that is what we are called to do. But to clear the air, let me ask you a question. How are you going to do that if you're not here? COVID really changed a lot of things for us here in the media aspect and the internet streaming, YouTube channel, getting our services available for those who are unable to attend. Travels, sickness, uh, bed rest, whatever. There's a number of things that can uh, result in a person needing to be absent from our gatherings here weekly and to view on the internet. You can be encouraged in your faith. You can be challenged to stand for Christ. But you cannot be effective in the mutual encouragement of one another in this assembly unless you're here. And so we must not Forsake it as the habit of some is. Now, all of this is for the purpose of carrying everyone safely through. Notice the way this passage ends, and we'll pick up next time here. Verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. The goal is, of the church of Jesus Christ is for everyone to come and to continue to come and find grace to help in the time of need. To stand, to stand firm and stand to the end and stand when no one else around us is standing. To stand alone if we have to. That's what we're called to do. And the third thing we are called is to support one another because... We are called to help make sure that the person in front of us, behind us, and to each side of us, that they make it as well. And that's the challenge for today. How are you helping one another stand? Father, thank you again for our time today. I, I do pray that you would give to us the help that we need, the strength that we need each day to approach you with our requests, to cast our cares upon you, to mediate for one of our brothers or sisters who's fallen, to consider ourselves lest we are tempted as well. Father, help us each day to have confidence and boldness to approach you. Not because of who we are or what we offer, but because the way has been opened through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to stand, to do right in the midst of an evil world. Give us integrity. Give us boldness. Give us faith to walk according to the way that you've asked us to walk. And Father, give us a burden for one another. I pray that each week there would be individuals on our mind that we might say a word to, to check in on. We might say a word of encouragement that might lift their spirits and help them to carry on and to turn around or to make some turns and refocus on keeping our eyes upon you. Father, give us wisdom and discernment in knowing those who are close to turning back. 
And Father, give us a drive and a passion to go after them and to do everything we can to see them stay and to stand and to stand strong. Help us not to forsake each time we gather together to use it to benefit one another. And we do this more and more until that day approaches, the day of your coming. Until then, keep us in your grace. Strengthen us by your power. Watch over us by your guidance and love. And make us into the people you'd have us to be. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We had several important themes in our message this morning, but for our closing song, I'd like for us to return to the theme of Come. 338, you'll see the song, Come, Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. Will you please stand with me as we sing? service where Chuck gives a report about his recent missionary work in Africa. It's always inspiring to hear how God is working around the world. Mm -hmm.